may have screamed like a little girl. I don't know. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to episode five of The Squadron. If this is your first time joining us, The Squadron is a podcast devoted to optimizing the health and wellness of cops and first responders all over the world. Now, that's a big project. So what I'm talking about is your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, even your spiritual health, and of course, some of the environmental issues that we deal with as well. Part of that project is documenting my journey, trying to get fit in all of those ways, and applying some of the lessons I learned by some of the, from some of these experts that we talked to, and reporting back on that. And today is one of those episodes where we check in with Traver Bohm, my coach, and uh, see where I'm at, at least with the some of the physical and mental stuff. Uh, today is a really great episode. I'm very proud of this episode. We go pretty deep on a lot of the things I think everyone can relate to. Um, we talk about the excuses we tell ourselves uh, about what's preventing us from achieving uh, the kind of fitness that we want, uh, the kind of excuses and justifications that we give to ourselves that really aren't legitimate, uh, but on the surface, they make us feel better. Uh, we go into family relationships and uh, even alcohol use and how alcohol is a good cover for some of the other problems that might be out there. Uh, we scratch the surface of PTSD a little bit, but uh, we talk a lot about how um, the the comfort of laziness and how to, how we're trying or how I'm trying to overcome that. Um, we recap the first 30 days of my time with Traver, and you'll uh, hear that I've actually done pretty well. Had some setbacks, uh, actually several significant setbacks, but overall um, have gone into the first month doing real well. Now, if you have listened before, you'll notice, you might catch that this episode was recorded before episode four, and uh, there's a little bit of out of order in the terms of with Traver, we talk about the importance of getting a coach and the importance of building a team, something we talked about a little bit in episode four with Eric Malzone. We also spoke with it in episode three with Craig Amundsen. So it's a theme, though, that keeps coming up. But yes, uh, this episode, as you're listening to it now, is a little bit old. You'll hear me mention spring break for my kids. When we were launching the podcast, we had some technical delays. Uh, so this uh, episode got pushed a little bit and it got swapped with a couple others. So hence, it's a little out of order in the way they were recorded, but it's still chronological. Uh, so it won't affect anything. And in a couple of weeks, we'll be caught up with uh, present day. If you want to know how to support the show, uh, the best thing you can possibly do is go to iTunes uh, if you uh, have an iTunes account or Stitcher, if you are on an Android, uh, and subscribe to the show and leave a review. Uh, leave a positive review, a five-star review if you feel it's worthy, and give a little description of why you think the show is valuable. That really is a huge, huge deal for us uh, and, uh, and iTunes. iTunes has some crazy algorithm where they take uh, amount of downloads, amount of subscribes, and the amount of reviews to see where things rank and to put where things are placed in the ranks. Now, I'm not really big on the ranking, and that's not my goal here, but my goal is to get as many people to listen to this as possible because I do think we have valuable information. And if it's searchable and it's at the top of the charts, uh, either in the fitness category or in the government category, then it makes it more uh, it makes it more accessible to more people. And that's the goal. That's all we're trying to do. So leave a review. Uh, subscribe to the show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Squad Room. If you have a show idea or a comment or a guest you'd like to see on the show, please shoot me an email at squadroompodcast at gmail.com. So let's get into it with Traver. Uh, he's back, and uh, it's, a like I said, a really great episode. It's long. I do want to give fair warning in advance uh, that we use adult language uh, throughout, and this uh, episode is marked explicit. Um, moving forward, we're going to try and cut that out. I know that's a uh, uh, prohibits some people from listening sometimes with uh, people in the car, uh, young ones in the car. And I want to make this accessible as I can. Um, this was recorded just as two friends chatting. And uh, yeah, so there's adult language, not something to have uh, when you're in a PG or G audience. Um, nothing uh, horrible, but we just use the, the words you'd expect adults to use. Anyway. 
Thanks so much for listening. Uh, Have a great week. Stay safe and take care of each other. All right, Trevor, welcome back. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So um, I thought I'd tell you a funny story. Go for it. I'd love to hear a funny story. Totally not related to. Even better. So so, uh, we get a call of a of a ex-boyfriend trying to break into a house. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, the call sounded pretty pretty legit. So we're, we're going in hot, you know, code three, lights and sirens and all that. And we get there, and it's a, it's a giant compound. Okay. Like, I mean, the Kennedys, I think. Oh, wow. You know, there were, so this call ended up being at the guest house of the guest house. Oh. The guest house actually had a guest house. Oh, fantastic. Which, of course, the guest house <laughs> of the guest house was still way bigger than my house. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it, it, we figured it out. Turned out, you know, turns out, so shockingly, the the ex-boyfriend, as the uh, reporting party called it, was not the ex-boyfriend. It was the current boyfriend. Okay. Um, but had uh, discovered our reporting party in, in, in bed with someone else. Ah. Uh, he happy. was... Reasonably upset. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So during this, uh, because there's multiple houses on the same compound, we ended up, uh, all the people kind of came out of the woodwork and wanted to see what was happening and why all, you know, all the cop cars with the lights and the sirens were yeah. on their property. So we had a lot of people milling around. And this one guy, kind of a goofy guy, um, came into the house that we were in and, and offered his help. And, you know, said, hey, I, you know, I know them. I know what's going on. If you need anything... Uh, you know, I'm here to help. Excellent. My deputies thanked him, and I had gone off to move, get my car closer because I had to park so far away. So I was out there, and he said, "Hey, have you seen Sarge?" And I, you know, I'm a patrol sergeant, so yeah. common parlance. You know, nickname for me is Sarge. Usually. Yeah, it's usually how I get referred to, at least in front of my face. Um, <laughs> so uh, my 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 guy says, "Oh, uh, he's outside." I was outside. Oh, okay, so guy leaves. Comes back a couple minutes later, a little more concerned. I, I, I can't find Sarge. I, I, really, I really need to find him. Uh, my guy goes, oh, well, he's not here. Um, he's probably out talking to one of your neighbors or something like that. Yeah. Right? Comes back, okay, all right. And uh, the guy was, you know, pretty a Twitter. Comes back in, he's like, no, I just can't find him. I mean, you know, maybe he went down to the beach. My guy's like, I don't know, why, Sarge, why would Sarge go down to the beach? Yeah. This, this has nothing to do with... Right, he's like, oh, all right. Well, he's you know he's still in the middle of his his interviews and all that, so he's not paying much attention to this guy. Right. He's like, all right, man, whatever. Maybe yeah, maybe he's down at the beach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll shift break. <laughs> yeah. Right. Guy Lee's comes back. He's like, no, no. I'm pretty sure. I know it. I know Sarge. Uh, I know. I know that when he gets scared, he goes down to the beach. Uh. And my guy again is like, <laughs> okay, hey, why is why is my Sarge know this guy so well that this guy knows right. he gets scared. He thinks, well, that doesn't. Sergeant didn't seem real scared about this yeah, call or anything yeah, yeah. like that. What's what's Stuff going on? That up. Yeah, and and then why does he know this guy? And whatever. So um, the guy's like, no, no. He tends to go run down the beach when he gets scared. And then finally, my guy stops. Was like, clicks. You talking about my sergeant? He goes, no, Sarge, <laughs> the lab, the white lab that lives here. <laughs> so you never know what you're gonna get. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh huh. We've been, what's it been, like three weeks since we last talked? Yeah, roughly three weeks. And we've, we've talked a little bit in the interim, um, but not on recording anyway. So some interesting things have happened. Yeah, give me a rundown on, on, on what you've been through in the last couple of weeks. Okay, so... Uh, Big stuff, little stuff, give it all. Yeah. We, um, we, we, we recorded, and then I got my kind of go-ahead plan from you of mm-hmm. my workouts for that week, and I did the, the first one. Felt awesome. Felt great. great. And then uh, that was my day off, and then went into work the next day for my Monday. Okay. And right at the beginning of shift, uh, car battery died okay. in my car. And I drive a SUV, and most of the other guys drive sedans. So they had all gone off to breakfast or to go handle stuff. So I was alone at the station, so I just took care of it myself, but I had to move the cars into position so I could get them jumped. I almost set one on fire, but that's a different story. <laughs> that's next week. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so as I'm going back and forth between the cars, I'm getting into an SUV, I'm getting into the sedan, back and forth. I go to sit down in the sedan, and the seat, well, for whatever reason, the seat was further back and lower than I was expecting. Okay. And I came, I came down with some force. Okay. 
out of that seat and immediately my, my back seized up okay i went from my started at the pelvic bone there right above the gun belt and the handcuffs up to, up my lower back to my shoulder blades and then Ooh. down to about the mid thigh okay so totally locked up yeah so serious um may have screamed like a little girl i That's don't know okay. um and sat there for a little bit and let it kind of re- let it calm down a couple minutes later i was able to kind of extricate myself from the car okay and after a little bit felt okay so uh you know none of us in law enforcement are immune to back problems and we all have little tweaks and pinches and all that sort of stuff so right. i kind of chalked it up with that went off to uh i actually go get something to eat and i was sitting at a stool like a high up stool from where i was eating finished and i went to get off and i stepped with my right foot i put all my pressure on my right foot and i just almost fell into a table of people oh, wow. uh, eating because my back just said yeah no we're not gave gonna out. do this today and it gave out okay so obviously i uh, ended up off work for uh about a week while that calmed down okay um was of course prescribed no physical activity yeah of course um i was you know muscle Cut relaxers right. and all that yeah. stuff which just to me don't work yeah. and i hate taking anyway yeah so, uh, that was, that was an issue. After a couple of days, I felt good. Came into the, try another workout. I did, I lifted, uh, a, one weight off the ground, felt that tweak again and said, yeah. okay, no, it needs more time. Good, so, smart. Yeah. It was certainly frustrating, but yeah, of course. I didn't want to do any more damage. And then, uh, so that was an issue. But then uh, towards the end of that week was feeling good again, was feeling loose, um, and got the stomach flu. Oh, right as I was ready to come back. Yep, yep. So I spent uh, several days, uh, again, missing work. I haven't missed this much work in a long time. Uh, no, ever, actually. Um, but I spent several days glued to a toilet. Oh, um, fantastic. So that was the con. Okay. The pro was I lost nine pounds. <laughs> yeah, screw all this workout stuff. I'm just going to take diuretics because... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much water is left in my body right, after that, right, but it's all gone. Right, right, right. So yeah, no, nine pounds in two and a half days. Oof. It was brutal. Yeah, it's not good for you. All right, yeah. So shook that off, got back to work. Um, I'm, I'm still dealing now with some little sinus thing. But anyway, okay. so uh, as of today, actually, um, in uh, large in part to due to the flu, but also eating better and doing the journal that you prescribed the food journal and documenting all my food and trying to go to an 80, 20 paleo. Excellent. Some success, some not. Okay. Uh, and more importantly, the not drinking thing. Excellent. Uh, down 14 pounds. Excellent. Yeah. Not a bad start. Right. I noticed that yesterday when I was putting my, uh, my gun belt on and it, it actually went on without grunting and beautiful having to twist into awkward positions to get it beautiful (laughs) you know one thing to do if you once you realize you've lost over 10 pounds or anything significant and i have all my uh, clients do this is now go back and pick up something that's 15 pounds so next time you're in the gym pick up a 15 pound plate and walk around Uh, i have a client that's now up to over 60 pounds that she's lost in a year wow and i've had her pick up 60 pounds and then walk 400 meters and say this is what you were carrying for the last year and it's it doesn't register really until they actually have to hold the weight uh, and, and realize that it's it's a burden. It's not just a burden on movement, but it's a burden on everything that you try to do. From the moment you get up to the moment you go to bed, it's a physical burden, but it's also a mental burden. And just to then at the end of that, have them put that weight down in one movement and realize, God, I'm so much freer mm-hmm. is, is very powerful. So yeah, next time you're in the gym, pick up a 15 pound plate, walk around. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah definitely. I remember doing that long time ago I on the last oh, what, episode one I, I talked about how I lost a lot of weight doing the body for life program when mm-hmm. I was in my early 20s and something close to 50 pounds and I did that with a couple sacks of potatoes and I walked around a, I did a lap around a grocery store yeah. and I thought oh my gosh so I'll do that again it's yeah I this remember is that how much motivating. harder everything is with extra weight yeah you know we, we don't want to pick on the weight weight is not the the, the issue itself but it's what you it, it's what you're gonna feel it's the it's the for lack of a better term, the burden on your life, you know, and and mentally, physically, emotionally, every aspect of your life knows that weight is there. So just having a a, a break like you did, 15 pounds is not the end goal, but it is something significant that you can feel. And that feeling will then drive into your momentum and go, okay, if I can lose 15 and I can feel this much better, imagine if I double that, imagine if I triple that, imagine if I lose a hundred pounds. There are officers I'm sure that are, that, that could lose 60, 70 pounds. Oh, sure. Yeah. And just think of how every aspect of their lives, literally from how they get out of the bed 
do how many times a day would you say you get in and out of a car oh man uh the average easily into the dozens oh my lord okay so you're pulling that weight in and out in and out in Mm -hmm. and out over and over and psychologically every time you have to struggle against that weight it's a little bit of a chip at your psyche a little bit of chip at your self-esteem yeah absolutely now that chip is not as is not as strong and the momentum too you know it's it i was struggling the first week uh and I, granted, I know weight's not everything, but I know yeah. that the first thing to expect is to lose a little water weight yeah. uh, as you're hydrating and eating well and not retaining water. But, you know, not seeing a lot, not, not even a lot, but just a couple of pounds quickly yeah. is is like, oh, this is going to be such a slug. Right. But losing that much over the last three weeks has been like, OK, now I got to make sure I don't. I'm, I'm in defense. I, I don't want to make sure I gain it back. Right. Absolutely. Because I have this opportunity. Right. Uh, given to me through the through these other issues <laughs> through emetics through you know to kind of get a, it feels like a head start like yeah. I, I'm like okay this is some momentum I want to use to continue downhill I don't want to yeah. you know say oh I lost 14 pounds so I'm going to go have a plate of nachos right because I just I can right absolutely so, well no I I gotta be careful because yeah, I can't. Like I just paid off a thousand dollars off my credit card. I'm not gonna go shopping. Right. I'm gonna let this momentum ride. So, uh, because of this, uh, all this free time that I had mm-hmm. now lying around on the couch or or whatnot, uh, I had some blood work done. I cool. actually just got the results before I came up here and uh, just only took a brief look at it uh, and went to. I've seen a bunch of doctors and stuff over the last couple days and weeks because the lumbar strain exacerbated some numbness and okay. tingling in the front of my thighs. Okay. Um, so there's some nerve issues. There's some nerve issues. Although, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I go to my doctor and I explain the nerve stuff, the kind of that feeling on the front of the thigh, like it's kind of deadened. Mm-hmm. And I've been getting this burning sensation in the thigh too. That okay. kind of come that like feels like someone's stuck a hot poker in your thigh. Oh, well. Real weird. And my doctor, uh, Ordered some blood tests. There was some, sounds like it's very minor, but they're going to do some follow-ups. And, uh, but what's interesting is, so I, I, I got back to a physical therapist yesterday, um, Great. which was prescribed because of the, the back strain. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, man, just like doctors or everybody else, physical therapists aren't created equal, right? I mm-hmm. mean, there's, there's different mindsets within physical therapy and I finally I think I found the right guy for me he Good. has a he's actually like a master powerlifting champion oh cool um, and he's got a long history in weightlifting and stuff but he comes with a very biomechanics emphasis on stuff so I've done physical therapy in the past when I broke my back or um, with my hands and every time I talk about and, I, and, and about a year ago I started trying to go f- to physical therapy preventatively saying, hey, I don't have any issues right, right now. My right. back's feeling good, but with the you. work I do and the size that I am, and I just don't want 20 years down the road, I don't want my knees to be blown. So what can right. I do? Right. And their response, like most was, well, you're, we got back problems, so let's strengthen your back and let's strengthen your core. Let's do that. Right. Which is understandable, and that, but that seems to be the common response. It's, yeah. what I, it's a response I'd expect from like a, you're, you know, kind of a run-of-the-mill fitness trainer maybe right 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 so i go to the physical therapist yesterday though and he takes one look at me and how i'm standing barefoot and he goes it's your quads huh because i got kind of big quads yeah yeah that gun belt is pushing your hips forward Uh, into that would be extension right mm -hmm. pushing your hips forward and angling them forward which throws off your hamstrings making your hamstrings tight which is putting all that tension on your lower back so your back can never relax right and of course you're throwing your back out right um, he's like, because, but your quads are strong because it's carrying all that weight because your hips are tilted forward. Right. So uh, he worked on me a little bit yesterday, a little bit. It was the most painful. <laughs> <laughs> so he's doing a lot of myofascial release and uh-huh. stuff. And holy cow. Um, but uh, I stood up afterwards and it was the first time I felt like I was actually standing on even weight on both feet. Oh, excellent. Forever. Wow. Very felt powerful. like my pelvis had reset. Good, good, crazy, good, good. and that was one visit. So I obviously good. there's a lot of work to be done there, but um, feel like I'm kind of on a path there. So anyone, uh, <laughs> let me back up. His assistant, as they're doing the kind of diagnostic test, I'm explaining and showing her how I have to kind of force myself to sit in the car because they're not built for all the gear we wear. So mm-hmm. I, I put all my weight on my right butt. And I kind of throw my left hip out because that's the only way I can get into the seat. Mm-hmm. And my shoulders are rounded forward because I'm reaching for the steering wheel. Mm-hmm. 
And she was like, well, can't they just get you a different car? I was like, mm. that doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get to pick, you know. Right, right, right. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of how I've adapted to having to work within that environment of being yeah. in the car. Same, Almost same thing with sitting in a, in a chair typing a report. Right. You know, you're, you're sitting down, but then all that weight's pushing, weight's pulling your pelvis down. Right. Which throws you off. And then you're rounding your back, back yeah. to get, to kind of compensate. Plus right. you have to kind of overcompensate for the vest. Right. And go around that as you're typing. So you're typing oh, all wow. hunched over. Like, so, um, definitely something I recommend for people to go pursue a sports, I, I don't know how you say it, but a sports based or sports minded physical therapist right. who looks at function and body movement, not just, you know, musculoskeletal issues. Yep. Uh, and then actually tomorrow I have, uh, an appointment with a sports chiropractor, which oh, I excellent. look forward to. Cause I haven't been, I love chiropractors. I just haven't been since I broke my back. Okay. So we'll see, see what they have to say too. And I'll report back on that. Excellent. Yeah. Test around, you know, people have, it's, it's in every profession. There's, there's good, there's bad, there's the top of the field and there's people that relate to what you do. Mm -hmm. And, and one of my gripes with, uh, people that try alternative medicine and have one bad experience. They say, well, I went to a chiropractor. It didn't work. I'm never going to another chiropractor. Like how many times have you been to an MD and gotten a prescription and it didn't work? Right. You don't all of a sudden, well, that's the last MD I'm ever going to go to. Uh, there's test them out. Go, go, go find someone that works for you. You need to assemble. We can talk about this on a, a later issue, your own team, your own wellness team. Yeah. Especially people who have in, in law enforcement have the, the deck sort of stacked against them. Uh, physically and mm -hmm. health wise, you need to have like a, your little race car, but you get driven all over the place, crashed into the wall, and then there's no one there to put you back together. That's absolutely yeah. right. And that's kind of where I, yeah. So I guess that's a better way of describing where I feel like I'm at is I'm kind of putting this team together. Good, 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 and, good. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's silly. And it's, I'm sure people listening are going to think it's silly to think that you need a team of people around you, but you really do. You do. Um, we're sometimes referred to as these, you know, as a tactical athlete. Right because we like to call everything tactical. <laughs> uh, but you really are some you're I mean the the weight we carry with the gear, you know, the expectation that we're wearing these 8-inch boots but be able to run in them. Right. Or um it's just absurd to think that we can function going in and out of a car a couple right. dozen times a day. Right. Running, climbing stuff, carrying all that gear, then sitting in a chair for hours upon hours writing a report about all right. that stuff we just did. Hunched over. And not be messed up. Yeah, how can you not? So to unscrew yourself from that situation, you can't, it's really hard to do it by yourself. Right, right. And I can kind of, like yesterday, I, could, I can tell that I put all my weight on my right foot. Right. But I didn't know why. Right. And I didn't know how to solve that problem. And I don't, and I'm still learning how to not do that. Right. But if I don't know how to fix it, right. all I know is I have a problem, right? If, if, if I got a knife wound on my arm and I'm bleeding out, well, not from my arm. If I got a, if I got a femoral bleed, right. right, I can recognize I got a femoral bleed, but I'm going to die if I don't know right. how to fix it. Yeah. So I better know how to fix it. Yeah. And this is the same thing. It's just a slower death. Right. Absolutely. That's the way I see it. It absolutely is. You know? It absolutely is. Um, so yeah, so I got some. I got my blood work done. I'll post it on uh, on the website just for I don't know people who are dying to know. But it's actually very uneventful for the most part, and that's a good thing, right? With good. blood work, the only thing that's high are my triglycerides. Okay, at three twenty. Okay, so, yeah, that's high. That's high. It's about double what it was the last time I had a test, and then my surprisingly my HDL cholesterol is low. Okay, by a little bit. So I know, yeah, I got to be more careful with taking fish oil and stuff. Yeah, and, you, and your diet's getting cleaned up, you know, and, and diet takes some uh, some time to, to set into your blood work. Yeah. Um, it's not an overnight fix. It's not, I had a great, great week last week. My blood work's going to be good. Yeah. You know, it, give it some time. But one of the things that you're doing is taking this process and extending it out. So it's not a, how do I feel this week? It's not a, how do I feel this month? It's, this is the rest of your life plan. And so even when we talked, you brought up in the beginning that you had some major setbacks, even in the first week, uh, which I think is very, uh, it's very common and not to get airy fairy, but I, I believe when people make big decisions as you have, you're going to get tested. You're definitely going to get tested. Yeah. And it's whether it's the universe or God or Oprah or whoever, something's going to come Oprah. along. It's always Oprah. <laughs> something's going to come along. Okay. You've made a big decision here. You've made a proclamation to the world, to your family, to me. Let's see if you're serious. Let's see how you deal with a back injury. Oh, good. You got through that. Let's give you the flu. 
Yeah. Let's see if you're still into this as opposed to, oh, the first couple of weeks are amazing. Everything's great. And it's just this smooth, linear ride upward the whole way through. And I think in reality, too, uh, it's always going to be something, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're, it's always, always, we're always going to have something in our head or something in our life that's going to be obstructing us, whether yep. it's ourselves yep. or the flu mm-hmm. or f- my biggest challenge in the next two weeks is that the kids are coming up on spring break and I'm going to okay. have them at home for, for my days off. Right. Okay. So, and, and a family visit. Okay. So that's the challenge I have coming up. Right. Okay. So that extends another two weeks. Well, right. I can't wait another two weeks to yep. like get back on the horse. I got to find a way to manage right. my way through that. Right. It's always going to be something. It's always, always going to be a, there's always going to be some bills to pay that are going to maybe occupy my mental st- mental mind, right, you know, right. my, my mental space. I mean, just, so I think these were physical manifestations of that, that were a mm. good reminder, mm-hmm. but it, I, in reality, I got to acknowledge anyone has to acknowledge. It's always going to be something, right? You're always going to be confronted with something, um, overtime work or being held over or just uh, those things. So, yeah, no, it, it, at, of course, at first I, I was just <laughs> distraught. Of course. At this, I was, you know, like I went in hard charging and right. then it was like throwing the emergency brakes on. But well, it's how you manage these, these, these challenges, yeah. you know, and we look at your life and it's not just the physical. So what other aspects of your life? Say you do have a back injury. Okay. You literally can't train. It's not smart to train. Training is going to set you back further. Well, what can you do? Is, your, is the only aspect of what you're trying to do physical and can it only be addressed through movement and fitness? No, absolutely not. So if when you, what we talked about, when your back got hurt, now it's time to double down on your nutrition. Mm-hmm. Now it's time to make sure that every meal is perfect. You have one, an hour a day that you didn't have before because you're not in the gym. What can that be hour be used for? Can it be used for coming up with recipes? Can it be used for coming up with meal planning? Can it be used for shopping? Can it be used for cooking? Can it be used for meditation? Can it be used for journaling? Can it be used that you've got a, ball, a lot of balls in the air, one dropped? It doesn't mean we walk away from all the other ones and go, oh, shit, we're done now. And when I can pick that one ball back up, then the other ones go up too. Yeah. So it's really managing first your state. Thinking, okay, this happened to me. Shit, it sucks. All right, mm-hmm. well, now how can I turn it into, even if it's not a positive, even if I'm upset and depressed and pissed off, what else can I do? Yeah. It doesn't all have to be um, you know, sunshine and roses. You can go, all right, this, I'm really upset about this, but... I'm not giving up on myself or this process, and I'm looking at the long term. One week is nothing in the next 40 years. It's not, and that's how that's the process you're engaged in. Yeah, is that this is now a life decision. It's not a. There is no timeline on it. It's just getting healthy and staying healthy. Yeah, I, you've run the gym for many years now, and mm-hmm. you have other clients. I mean, you must have a long laundry list of excuses people give you, but yeah, there, there must be some common ones that people have. Absolutely. And, um, I was curious what those are and then, um, maybe what your response to those is. Sure. Sure. So one of the major ones we get, uh, is I don't have time and that's something that truly, truly, and time and money seem to be people's challenges. And, and I get it. I, you know, I don't have a lot of time and I don't have a lot of money or those are the things that trip me up too. But time is always a matter of priorities. Uh, I, I always ask people, um, what do you do? And, and the, the famous question is, what's the, what's the most productive day of the year for anybody? And that's the day before they go on vacation it's because they <laughs> have to get everything done. You just have to. Yeah. You, know, you can't not get up. You can't not make your flight. Uh, I've had clients say, well, I can't make a 6 a.m. class. I just can't get up that early. Or I can't make a 6 a.m. training session. And so I literally ask them, have you ever flown at 6 a.m.? Like, oh, God, yeah, I've had a 4 a.m. flight or a 4.30 a.m. flight. Like, well, what would you do? Well, I got up and I went to the airport. Okay, well, then get up and go to the gym. It's just a different shift in priorities. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then we can start to look at if it's time, where are you spending your time? How much time are you on Facebook today? How much time are you just screwing around on the Internet? How much time are you sitting at your desk doing something that was inefficient? Where are those little gaps of time that if you got rid of them would actually give you the time to get to the gym? But most importantly, and what's underneath, I think, every excuse, every uh, reason why people aren't sticking to their program is a priority shift and they haven't made the full decision and the full commitment that come hell or high water this is something they're going to do you have kids there are, you i'm sure there are nights when your kids are crying and you're like nah i'm just not going to do it tonight sorry or nah <laughs> just not going to feed the baby you know what there's something on tv so that once the your child comes into your life the priority shift is massive 
Yeah. Same. Th- so it, we're trying to artificially uh, create that same same situation, and, and that takes time. That takes effort. That takes constant reinforcement of yourself, as we've talked about. You are now having to use a different skill set and a different mindset than you were a month ago. Uh, we use the analogy that you know uh, you, the crossover dribble you used in, in eighth grade basketball doesn't work in high school now. So we've got to come up with some new skills. We've got to come up with some new reinforcements. But most importantly, you now have to realize that you're a high school varsity athlete. And that has to get swallowed. That has to get swallowed down deep to where there is no option but to take care of yourself. There is no option except to go to the gym. This is part of who you are. You are not going to skip work as a, a police officer, just like you're not going to skip going to the gym. So excuses is said, you name it, I've gotten it. Um, from stuff that's immediate. Oh, my car wouldn't start. I don't give a shit. Walk to the damn <laughs> gym. Uh, I don't care what, if you're committed and, and you hear of people that are so committed that are home at midnight, studying till two, mm-hmm. up at six, back in the gym. Well, if they can do it, what's the difference? Biologically, they're the same. So it's some kind of commitment or shift that they've made that, that people haven't. What do you think it is uh, that hold, that slows people or holds people up? Is it just comfort they're more comfortable being uncomfortable that that this is their life and this is just kind of how it is and they this is unknown yeah it's it's a big question you know and it's it's a difference for everybody's unique in the challenges that they bring and the fears that they bring and the insecurities that they bring in you know one of the things i asked you to do this week that we can talk about is what benefit are you getting from being out of shape what benefit do people get i asked them straight up what benefit do you get from living how you live now if you're 100 pounds overweight, then you don't have to look about look at your food. You don't have to think about your food. You don't have to be okay with people. I have a lot of uh, some female clients that are overweight, and when they've lost weight, they weren't comfortable with male attention. Hmm. So what is it that, that what is the, the payoff that you're getting from your situation? And then what's the fear and the uh, apprehension if you actually reach your goal? You know, for you, say you lose 100 pounds and you get in the best shape of your life. That's that's scary to some people because now you got to hold that. It's just like financially, what happens if I become a millionaire? Great, I'm a I'm a prodigy. But now, what if I lose it? Holy shit, that's far more terrifying. I'd rather stay here in this broke state where, one, I'm not really responsible. It's not my fault. It's someone else's deal. I, that you know, I just I have bad luck. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of fear and apprehension, both of goal achievement and fear of and apprehension of, of what happens along the way. So you said it's like the devil I know is the devil I'm comfortable with, right? I, I'm, I'm okay being in this sort of miserable state because I know it. Yeah. I get it. It's, it's, I'm okay with it. It's, comfort, it's comfortable. It's, it's, it's what I know every day. But stepping out of that now, is, it's scary as hell. You know, it's, it's scary as hell to go, wow, I'm going to transform my life. What happens? What am I going to – what friends may I lose along the way? What, what new friends may I gain? What new experiences? It's leaving that comfort zone. It's leaving that island and, and sailing across to the other island. You cannot conceptualize fully what your life is going to look like with change. And change is scary as hell, man. It's scary for me. It's scary for everybody because it is the unknown, and that's not where we, we live. Biologically, the unknown is not cool. You know, we go back to living in the cave. All right, <laughs> I'm cool here. You know, I, I right. get it. There's some bad things out there, and I'm just going to stay where I'm at. And I think that's hardwired into us that change could either go one way or the other, but both ways are scary. And so getting to the the core issue, you know, why are you afraid of success? What is the benefit of being where you are now? These are important questions to ask yourself and to ask. I ask my clients and students of what happens if you lose 100 pounds? Oh, shit. I have to get a whole new wardrobe. What happens if you gain it back? Then I am a failure. Okay, are you? Or are you just someone who lost 100 pounds and gained 100 pounds? I guarantee you, you can find some other people out there that have gone through what you've gone through mm-hmm. and worse. So it's, it's when we personalize our own situations heavily. I'm the only one that's going through this. I'm the only one. No, one, no one's deal is quite like mine. Yeah. Then you realize, wow, there's a ton of people out there. Like what you're doing of opening this up to the world. This is gonna, you are going to find people in your exact situation someone that's listening to this goes i am exactly that dude wow i am not unique i have the same challenges i have a bad back my leg is numb i pissed in my in my uh, keep bringing that up (laughs) i pissed in my pants the other day and worse you know so it's it's getting to the root of the fear i think is Mm -hmm. is truly 
um, what's underneath the excuses. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. That just kind of hit it. You, in order to change, you have to confront some yeah, things about yourself that absolutely. are kind of uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And I think it's that because you think about it, like if you told somebody, "Hey, do you do you want to be like this, the way you are now, unhappy, unfit, you know, m- moody, or unable to sleep, or whatever, or do you want to take the same amount of time you have in the day and then be?" healthy and fit and confident and social or whatever, nine, 99.9% of us would take yeah. the second option. Absolutely. But to get there, that really does require a lot of, even if it's not soup, not on the front of your consciousness, there's a lot of self-evaluation that goes into that. Absolutely. Even if it's just getting up every day, putting on your workout gear and going to the gym and seeing yourself in the mirror, there's a confrontation with yourself yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That can be uncomfortable, right? If yeah. you're 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 sitting at you're walking on the treadmill or running whatever, and you see yourself in the mirror, that's a little bit of a confrontation with yourself of uh, who you are. Yeah, it's and it's easier. It's easier not to go to the gym and avoid that mirror. Yes, and that awkwardness. So right. I'll just stay at home and eat a bag of Cheetos. Absolutely, it absolutely is. You know, my old boss uh, Gavin used to run workshops for people that won won the lottery. Because I don't know the exact st- statistic, but it's 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 a crazy statistic how many people win the lottery and then within a year or two are back to not only at their exact same financial point, but worse. Yeah. And if, if literally, if you were to ask everyone listening to this, would you like a million dollars? I would venture to say that 99.9 <laughs> would say yes. But then why is it that we can't handle it? Why is it that it's it's uncomfortable for us? Because people haven't gone through the process of changing who they are to become a millionaire. They were mm-hmm. suddenly thrust into that. Just like if we said, all right, we're going to cut a hundred pounds off of you and we're going to change every aspect of your life. And you're just going to wake up tomorrow morning. Just like that. You haven't done the internal processing. You haven't done the internal change to be not just comfortable with it, but familiar with it. And that's why I love taking a long time to get people to lose weight, even though it's, it's not the American way. It's not the, the take this pill and lose 25 pounds by tomorrow morning. Because there has to be internal transformation. Without that, then we're just going to go back to being the same person that carried the weight without the weight. And what are we? What's the first thing we're going to do? Put that weight right back on. Yeah, that's a good point. You you can you can lose all the weight, but if you're still the same person you were, yes, it's it's just superficial. Yes. Um. What are some of the things? that you had, you had me start a food journal. Yeah. And I've been documenting that for a couple of weeks. And then in the, in the last episode that you were with us on, you, uh, gave me some outlines or some guidelines. And one of those that you sprung on me was the no drinking for mm-hmm. 30 days. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was happy to report that for six days. I was super successful at that. Excellent. And then on the seventh day I failed. Okay. And then we talked about that yeah. in person once and, and, uh, that was in the middle of the back strain and um, other BS excuses. Yeah. And just caved. Right, right. You know, hot day outside. Yeah. You know, whatever. Um, and had a couple beers at night. And it was funny because, uh, you know, even for just six days of not consuming anything other than water. Mm hmm. I don't, the one good thing, I don't drink soda usually, um, good, or don't sugar drink drinks. Soda. Yeah. I, should have I was able to cut that out a couple of years ago. Um, but even just after one day, it reminded me, oh yeah, this is what, this is what it feels like to feel like crap. Yeah. Um, cause again, strong beer. Yeah. You know, intestinal issues and all that just kind of felt off the next day and all that. Yeah. Um, but since then, and it's only been, I guess we're coming up on two weeks since that. Okay. Now into three weeks since we've kind of started this whole thing, but um, since then it's like, uh, a, a, f- a switch flipped. Excellent. With that. And, and I, re- and really haven't thought about it or had a struggle with it since. What was the switch that flipped? I don't know. Okay. And, and, and well, actually I, if you did, know. maybe I, maybe I do know because the one time where I had some internal struggle with it was we had my wife and I, before we got started with this had scheduled to go to this school auction mm-hmm. benefit for our kids' school. Um, and, uh, so my plan was just, you know, I'm just going to have my, I mean, normally I, 
wine, wine and beer it up and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but I was just, you know, I wasn't really worried about it, but then we got there and it was like really, really good choice of wine Mm -hmm. and um, really good food and, um, way better than I expected it would be. But there was, there was just a lot of wine there that I am a personal fan of Mm -hmm. and was like, Oh, this is going to be miserable. It's, you know, it's like 75 degrees outside. It's sunny out still. Everyone's imbibing and, um, I was grumpy about it for like a half hour and I just started okay. pounding Pellegrino um, with lime, which for people out there, that's a good trick. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. want to go around and not draw attention, if you have a mineral water with a, with a lime in it, you look like you're drinking a gin and tonic. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I didn't get any questions or comments or the people who want to kind of drag you down with them yes. And, yes. And, and be negative about why you're not drinking. You know, I, there's people out there. If I said I, I'm just not drinking for a month, I'm trying to you know shake it off and lose a couple pounds. There's a lot of people out there that'd be great. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's good cool. For good yeah. for you. But there's a lot of people out there too who'll be like, Oh, oh yeah. come on, man, really? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know you you're you know you're gonna be boring now or whatever. Right, right. right. You don't want to be the. Those are the people you need to shed. Absolutely. Right. So luckily, I didn't get any of that. But after I don't know half hour, it's like I'm all right. I'll be good. okay. Good. 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 I'll suck down my Pellegrinos. Right. Let my wife imbibe as much as she wants. Uh, and, you know, I'll be right. And yeah. I was fine. Yeah. And then after that, I was all right. And good. since then, just haven't had a desire at all. Good. Taste. good I'm not going to say good. that's not going to last. Yep. But Probably won't. <laughs> it's been a couple of weeks of hot weather out here. Yeah. It's beautiful going to the beaches and stuff. So those are the, those are triggers. Those right. are some good triggers for me. Definitely. Working in the heat is a good trigger for, oh, I can't wait to have a beer when I get home and yep. peel this vest off. But even with those triggers, it's been a, it's been really good. And I'm sure that's that's the 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 weight is in there too. Those 14 pounds that are lost. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. My food's been okay, uh, better than normal, right? But not great, not right. not super clean. So it's got to be the fact that there's just I'm not taking in that extra couple hundred calories, thousand, twelve hundred calories yeah. a night in beer. Yeah, and think about when you drink, and it's on top of food. You know, so most of us don't drink four beers and then not have dinner or that's dinner for the night. If that's dinner for the night, then there's some other problems. There have been the- <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not since college. <laughs> we have some more to talk about. Uh, I think, you know, it's a really big point with alcohol and alcohol is a sticking, a sticky issue. One, it's so socially acceptable and it's so socially intertwined in our lives. Uh, it's like going to a party and not having a conversation. It's that much a part of our social culture. Mm-hmm. I think the, the first thing to do is, again, go back to why you're doing this. Anyone who's trying to lose weight, I recommend don't drink. Don't drink at all. Um, one, the c- caloric effect. Two, the infl- inflammatory effect. Three, the decision-making effect. But four is the, the disciplinary effect, where if you are literally trying to lose weight, then every ounce of discipline that you put in your backpack at the end of the day, every positive win that you get to throw in your pocket uh, – is a big one mm-hmm. and, and alcohol is a big part of that and, and viewing it less as abstinence and abstaining and viewing it more as this is something I'm giving to myself. I'm giving myself 30 days of sobriety as a gift. I'm giving this as an empowerment to myself. One, not to, not just to see if I can do it, but I want to wake up every day going yesterday. I wanted to have a beer and I didn't. I know I can have one tomorrow, but today I'm not going to. Mm-hmm. Because I've decided that I'm me, my health, my being, everything about me is far more important than the marketing, the seduction, the social aspect of the alcohol. And so it's, it's you against the world in effect. I, I view alcohol a, a lot of different ways, but I, one of the main ways I view it is it's a lie. It has been marketed as something that it's not. Most people do not wake up feeling good after drinking. And if that's a personal choice, go for it. Drink. If you love beer, drink beer, but be have a absolute awareness that it's not as sexy as it seems on TV. You are trying to build momentum, and really it's not about the alcohol. It's not about the beer. It's not about the wine. It's about the feeling that you get from it, mm-hmm. and that feeling for most of us is familiarity. It's something that we go to a party. We don't know a lot of people. Great. Now I have all these other effing humans staring at me. But if I have a couple drinks, they all seem okay. All of a sudden, I'm very interesting. Yeah, you know, I'm, uh, people so realize I how cool I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's really about that feeling. 
And what we're trying to do with especially a weight loss person or anyone who's in transformation is leave the familiarity because the familiarity is what we're walking away from. The familiarity is what has kept us in this rut. So every day that we can walk one step further away from the familiarity of going back to old habits, of going back to any way that we lived that wasn't uh, directly reaching us to our goals is a step in the right direction. So one, have awareness. Why do you want to drink? It's a really good question. And, and one of the things we talked about that night was uh, the night that, that you had a couple beers that you said you felt like you didn't have a lot of options. And that was your for, way. Yeah, for, str- yeah, for, for stress str- relief. For quote unquote stress yeah. relief. I'm feeling like to, I couldn't exercise because of my back and I right. couldn't get out. And Yeah. So I was, but I was, I was justifying it. Yeah. It's right? definitely it's just justification. justification of going back to, I know this works. I know this is going to help me relax for the next hour, two hours, et right. cetera. So we have to ask ourselves then what really are our options? And, and in my mind, they're unlimited. You could have meditated, you could have journaled, you could have walked around the block with your dog, anything, or, or even taking the kids for a walk or going in the backyard. There's, there's so many options that we are just not familiar with. Mm-hmm. And that's really about tapping into who we are. Again, looking at the big picture, does this support my goals? And if not, then why the hell am I willing to risk are three beers worth me getting off track? Right. Because three beers may just be the five degree turn that ends up a year from now, me being right back where I am today. Is that worth it to me? Right. Absolutely not. To me, it's not. It's, it's, it's straight up economics. It is not worth these, these three beers is not worth me giving up on the big picture. And it's, it may be, it may be what kicks me off the big picture. So F that I'm not even going to consider doing it. Yeah. I think you're right with familiarity kind of goes back to that. If, if you're familiar with yourself or you're familiar with your routine or you, you're familiar with the result that something is going to give you, it doesn't require any internal confrontation, mm-hmm. right? So if I know that the beers are going to get me relaxed and mm-hmm. get me calm, you know, just chill out and enjoy myself a little bit, a little loose, able to do bedtimes or whatever, right. then that's easier than trying to find a new routine or trying the new f- familiarity of any of the things you mentioned or... Right. Or, or, or addressing it in a different manner. It's or having confront your life and say, why is it at the end of the day I need an external source to relax? What about the last 12 hours was incongruent with how I now want to live? Right. And that's a big kick in the pants question of, oh, wow, okay, maybe I'm not as happy as I thought I am, or maybe this isn't working the way I, I thought it was. What other changes do I need to make? And life is hard. We're not just going to sit here and go, okay, we're not monks. We don't live in a cave. You have kids, you have a wife, you have a stressful job. You can't just walk away from all of that and say, okay, I'm just going to find my bliss and walk the earth like, uh, like the Buddha. <laughs> right. But what areas, what pieces can you put in during the day mm-hmm. so that we don't get to the end of the day and go, okay, I absolutely have no other option but to ingest a mild poison that is also a sedative that's also going to inflame my gut, which is also going to make me feel like shit about myself mm-hmm. just for an hour of relaxation. Well, when you say it like that, yeah, 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 yeah. And alcohol is a big issue. I guarantee you there are people listening right now who are just tuning out and going, this is bullshit. There's no way I'm I'm getting rid of my booze. There's no way I'm getting rid of my beer. It's a hugely emotional issue, hugely emotional issue, especially for men. This is part of who we are. I'm a dude. I'm a guy. They drink beer. Uh, But what, what we don't get told in that story is that we're dying 10 years earlier, that Mm -hmm. we have all these health problems, that prostate cancer and and other issues that affect only men are huge issues. That's not in the same commercial as all the guys with the six packs who are drinking the six packs. So we have to look at the truth of it. And then what is our truth? What is your personal truth? What is it for you? You're on a huge quest right now, Garrett, to, to not live in the way you, you, you lived before. That's swallowing a whole new truth. And how strong is that truth to you? And what does it mean to you? And what does it mean to your kids? And what does it mean to your family? And then put that up against three Mm -hmm. beers. And that's the big picture, but there's also the practical application. There was beer in your house. So if if you guys, anyone else undergoing a quest like this, the first thing we tell people and the first thing I talk about nutrition is get the shit out of your house. You know, if there's three beers sitting in my fridge and I'm going to go six months without drinking them, they will call to me. (laughs) <laughs> they will call to me at night. They'll call to me in the morning. Mm-hmm. So get rid of them. It's the same with bad food. You know, we can go into nutrition. Get rid of the chips. Get rid of the pasta. Get rid of the dairy. Get rid of the ice cream. Get it, get it out of your house. Don't give yourself the temptation. When people come out of AA, they don't say, all right, go get a job as a bartender. Right? Yeah. So if you're trying to lose weight, 
don't stack your kitchen full of stuff that's going to sabotage your goals. Sure. It's probably a good point. You touched on it a little bit ago. You asked me a question. You asked me a, a question via email to have ready. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you, how'd you phrase it? Uh, what, what are the, what are three of the benefits I'm getting from yeah, the, the from way situation, I, from my situation now? Yeah. And I never thought it's funny. Cause you know, everyone talks about the negatives of your current situation, only, right. but no one's ever posed the idea that there are benefits to oh, yeah. it. There have to be. And, uh, so that was, I was, that definitely made, gave me pause and I had to think. And then at first, you know, probably a standard response for, for people listening, really, if you think about what are the benefits of the lifestyle you live right now, mm-hmm. you think there aren't, well, if you're honest, you think, well, there aren't, really aren't that many, maybe. But like you said, in your examples to me, maybe it gets so you out of doing the, the yard work. Right. Or, um, you know, you don't have to uh, try too hard at certain things because right. people give you a pass, right? right. Uh, and I was thinking, and I, I really couldn't come up with something for a while. I was struggling. I was like, no. But one I realized was as a result of the, maybe as a result of the back injury was, this is horrible. I hate I, it. Um, it's <laughs> Spit it out. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. <laughs> like, um, it gets me out of playing with my kids. Okay. Now that sounds horrible. Yeah. Um, and the father of the year out there that's listening to this is going to be like, Oh my God, the guy hates playing with his kids. Not right. at all. No. Right. But after uh, a long day yeah. and um, coming home and doing all the other stuff, anyone who's being honest with themselves about who's a parent will say, yeah, there are some times where I'm just too tired to horse play and chase oh, the I'm kids sure. around the house and rough house with them. I just want to sit down, maybe read them a book right, and be mellow. Right. But kids choose their own times to be, you know, active. Right. And I, so I realized that when my daughter, who's the older one was feigning a back injury yeah. to get out of something. Yeah. <laughs> She's walking around the house like I do sometimes, you know, like hand on the back and I'm yeah. all walking all tweaked and uh, cro- crockety or crotchety. I just made up a word, crotchety. Right. Um, you know, you're all, your hips are out of whack and you're walking around the house and you got the pain face on. And my daughter was doing that. <laughs> Brilliant. She's trying to get out of something. And that's when I was like, oh, yeah, that is actually kind of, yeah. I guess that is a benefit because I, I can use it as an excuse. Sorry, kids. Dad, Dad's back hurts. Right. Um, you can't toss you up in the air right now or right. anything like that. So that was the one I was like, Oh man, you know, that's, that's yeah. kind of lame. And I, I would much prefer to be the energetic come home with a, come home as a ball of energy and get them all jacked up and riled up and play with them for a long time. I'd rather be that guy, you know, right, right, come right. home and dump my bags and collapse down onto the couch and want to watch TV show with them or, or worse, let them watch TV show rather than me being able to be active enough to get them out of the house or right, go do right, something. Right. So, you know, that, that was certainly, um, a benefit. Yeah. Um, and then another one I thought of, uh, was, you know, just the, the sheer joy of gluttony. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's great. Um, admit it. You know, it's like, I, I guess, I guess by not focusing on the the health and being healthy by 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 fr- by allowing myself not to do that I was able to enjoy other things. Right. My priorities were different. Right. My priorities were more well that's that's the right word gluttonous, right? right. Um and I I I afforded myself that quote unquote luxury of right. doing that. Right. And it was my excuse sort right. of well I'm I'm already kind of big. So what's the, what's that extra double IPA from that brewery I've never tried before worth right, or right, right, right. Um, like, I'm not even an, uh, I'm not even an ice cream guy, mm-hmm. but towards the end before we started, this was all about ice cream and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and all those sweets and treats that I typically don't, don't go for. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I guess that kind of was, uh, was another benefit too. Yeah, that one's bullshit. But they're both bullshit. No, but but they're not because they were. I mean, they were real to me. They're real. Yeah, and and if we look at them, think of them again as just the branch, and then what's underneath them. 
So gluttony usually is, is we're not dealing with something. We're not looking at something that we don't want to look at. So we cover it, we mask it, we hide it. What is it about your life or your being that you don't want to look at? And, and that's the question to start to ask. What is it about maybe parenting? That is it the, the energetics of it that it's taking more energy than you thought it would. And in order to actually have to articulate that or admit that, then you have to be healthy to experience it. Or, and I'm just throwing out hypotheticals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is it maybe that there's a conversation with someone's partner to say, hey, I need help parenting and I don't want to have that conversation. So now I don't have to parent because my back hurts. You know, pain is an extraordinary, uh, it, it gets us out of a lot of stuff in our culture, especially. You know, if you come to work and say, God, you know what? I really just don't want to be an officer today. You're going to be like, get in your goddamn car and go to work. But if you come to work and say, hey, I am in excruciating pain today. I can't even move. Then people get out of your way. People feel sorry for you. People give you attention. You're all this. It's a free pass. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the Band-Aid on a little kid. Everyone wants to run up and find out what happened, what happened, what happened. You get attention from it. You get love from it. Uh, there are definitely weight loss clients that if they lose the weight, their spouse will not be as attracted to them. Can you imagine having that kind of wow. dichotomy? Or if I get well, my spouse or my loved one won't take care of me. And that's the only way they experience love. When I'm healthy, they treat me like shit. When I'm sick, they love me and take care of me. Talk about a mind game to have to live through. Yeah. So really what we're after isn't the, the benefits, but what's underneath them. And then just to get even more of a pain in the ass, what's underneath that and what's underneath that. And it really comes down to your sense of self, your sense of self-honesty, and just what are the things that you're not managing in your life? Is it the conversation with your wife about parenting? Is it the conversation with yourself about parenting? Is it the conversation with yourself about what's under the gluttony? Are you not addressing something in your own life? And, and we're not, I don't want to go down a, a psychological wormhole, but these are questions that people mm -hmm. need to ask themselves. The manifestation of our external life, how we live, what we look like, for the most part, is a reflection of what's going on inside of us. And what's going on inside of us is absolutely terrifying to look at because we never get taught how to do it and we have no skills how to do it. And you can go sit down with a professional and I've sat down in front of professionals that I thought were fruitcakes and go, God, I can't believe I opened up and talked about issues with someone that's crazier than I am. <laughs> so it's, it's all a, it's all a mix, mm -hmm. but self-honesty is really at the, at the root of all of this. Sure. And it comes not only with the, the big decision you've made, but then being willing week after week to go, okay, I'm on a journey and all these signs and trip ups came up. So if I really want to get to the other side, if I really want a complete transformation or a, a metamorphosis, then I've got to be willing to look at the shitty shit. I've yeah. got to be willing to look in the mirror and go, fuck. Okay. That's the truth. All right. I got to deal with that. I think, um, particularly for first responders too, mm -hmm. it's important to be cognizant of the possibility of, uh, the job getting to you. Oh my God. Yeah. And, um, the very real possibilities of, of PTSD symptoms. Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. 100. Not even just symptoms, a diagnosis. Right. Yeah. Um, in, when I was in school, I did a, I did a paper on PTSD and cops, uh, and in comparison to the military. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a ton of studies out there. Um, that support it. But what I found was a, a cop by the end of his career, mm -hmm. you know, 20 to 30 years of, of police work, um, police have a higher incident of PTSD than an active duty, than the active duty military. Oh, per, wow. you know, if you That's say incredible. like per capita, you yeah. know, the same, um, there's not more by numbers, but you right, know, just, right higher rate you're, you're we have a higher rate of ptsd yeah, of course after a year after a 30-year career or so than active military and that's really something to say because the military of course we know deals with so much nasty stuff right and they're at war they're at war and there's debate right now about ptsd being overdiagnosed etc mm. but the but even if it's being overdiagnosed this the the fact that there are issues there that are being that, that are able to make that overdiagnosis, if mm -hmm. that makes sense, like mm -hmm. the mental issues of there's something, you know, recalling events or the right. poor sleep or the uh, changes in mood and behavior, right? Or the suicide rates and the suicide. Well, and that's that's not even you know, cops. 
we talk about alcohol a minute ago. Cops have a, one of the highest rates of alcoholism of any profession. We have one of the highest rates of suicide of any profession. That's insane. Um, Sorry to so that. it's just one of those things that, you know, we talk about a lot of this knowing yourself or knowing, right. knowing yourself inside or what's going on inside. But pe- guys really need to be cognizant of the fact that, too, that it could be something like that. And right. it may not even be, uh, it's not, it's probably not even one event, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, a lot of PTSD, people believe, is is, a, is one major critical incident call that you went to, but it's right. not. Right. There's cumulative PTSD, too, that's just, by the sake of doing the job long enough and seeing enough stuff, right. that you start to develop a lot of those symptoms. Right. Um, my, even myself, I... I uh, became concerned because of uh, an incident a couple of years, well, many years ago, I was brand new. And all of a sudden, for three or four months in a row, I just thought about that incident every mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. And I had to uh, pass by where that happened probably twice, once or twice a day. Oh, wow. And all of a sudden, after not bothering me for a couple of years, all of a sudden, it just, I focused on it daily it was yeah. it was bizarre yeah and that got me a little concerned that and I, thankfully i'm self-aware enough to think that's weird yeah. why is this coming up and why is all that right it went away right. and it's not something that i uh, am concerned with but i'm sure every officer out there listening has a call that they think about right or they pass by a spot where something happened <laughs> and they think about it i mean and i still have those around town i um there's a there's a bridge I pass over frequently where one of my closest friends in the department was in a shooting oh, wow. on a, on the highway. Wow. And I can't drive by that without thinking of that event. And I was one of the first of course. there to sit with him after it happened and all that. You know, that's, those are natural things. So there's yeah. a lot of natural things, and it's good for you to think about these things. It's certainly not good to push it down and suppress it. Absolutely. But for anyone listening who... Is, is connecting with our thoughts or our idea of, of trying to address the core issue that's causing the problem. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it to a quote unquote normal person, but for a cop, I would also say you've got to consider the fact or the possibility that it could be something related to work that you, that you may not even be aware of. That's just cumulative and is building up and building up and building up. And maybe that's why you're drinking a lot, or maybe yeah. that's why you're fighting with your wife or right. your husband a lot, or maybe right. that's why uh, you're you know your work performance sucks, right. or you're calling in sick a lot, right. or even the physical stuff. Maybe that's why you're you know getting sick a lot. Right. All those things can manifest itself that way. So, and we'll talk. I'll t- I'll I'm, I'm you're doing a big ca- podcast something. on PTSD, huh? Yeah. I, Excellent. So, but I mean that's a big one. That's yeah, it's huge, huge, right? So and that's and, and that's the same for firefighters and yep. and EMS guys too. It's something we need to be aware of. Definitely. Well, I think uh this is probably a good place to stop. Excellent. Um recapping here, it's always gonna there's always gonna be something. There's always yeah. gonna be a challenge. There's right. always gonna be an excuse. Yep. There's always gonna be the decision to either find time right. or find uh time ex- not to. Find, yeah. find that's a better way to say it. Find yeah. time or find time not to. Yeah. And um You've had me doing the food journal. I recommend that to anybody just as a snapshot to see where you're at. I've found that. Everything starts with awareness. Yes. You can't change it if you're not aware of it. And I've found that just even just keeping track and not not trying to um, intentionally change what I eat, but Mm -hmm. just... Uh, just being aware of it and having to write it down changes my decisions. Definitely. And that alone is, is, you know... It's huge. A a good game changer. Yeah, for sure. Um. Blood work is always important for people to get. Mm-hmm. I've got mine, and I'll I'll, I'll put it up. Um, and that team, building mm-hmm. that team, we got to start out. Go, got to go out and build that team. You know, and be okay that you can't do this all on your own. None of us can. Mm-hmm. Whether it's life, whether you're a law enforcement officer, whether you're a lawyer, it doesn't matter who you are. We need help. Yeah, this is life is not easy, and being healthy is not easy. So you, everybody needs a wellness team. Everybody, I don't care what your profession is, but especially people that are in awkward physical situations and awkward mental situations day in and day out all the more reason to have a team that yeah i mean your your physical fitness trainer your whatever you want to call a coach Mm -hmm. i call you coach um your coach 
physical therapist, mm -hmm. always a good thing to be proactive with. Definitely. Maybe a chiropractor. Definitely. A doctor. And if you can find a doctor who is forward thinking and yeah. is a preventative yes. kind of guy, yeah. you know, not a slap a slap a prescription on it for a painkiller and be right. done with it, but yeah. a but a real someone who goes out and tries to help you find the answer a to healer. prevent it. A yeah. healer, right. Which are hard, hard, becoming harder and harder to come across. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming, man. Not at all. Appreciate I appreciate it. it. All right. So there you go. Episode five in the books, done and over. Uh, episode six and seven are on their way. We're going to try and release these every week, at least for now. We're probably going to move to bi-weekly at some point, but for now we're doing it once a week as long as we can keep up or as I can keep up. I say we all the time, but there's no we. It's me. Uh, I guess it just makes me sound bigger if I say we. So anyway, uh, again, please leave a review uh, and subscribe on iTunes or on Stitcher. We have some uh, great content coming up, uh, some heavy topics coming up, some important topics coming up, and some fun topics coming up. I swear we're going to have some fun. These, uh, these episodes have been a little heavy, but we're going to talk to some great athletes and some great athletes who are cops and who have figured it out. And they're going to help us uh, find that path and figure out, well, if they can do it, why can't I? And of course, the answer is, of course you can. So take care of each other this week. Have a great one. Be safe and get out there and train. Because remember, you are a tactical athlete.